is hibernating in the sand. Crazy how skinny he is. I don't know, maybe I. Uh, he looks good. As long as he doesn't do that. Ten shovels sand, three shovels cement. It's the last of the cement right there. Wow. Okay, right there. Uh, and one shovel of that. It's kind of using it as an additive. Uh, Nice and watery, but not too watery. Uh, like two and seven eighths gallons. This is the last bit of three gallons right there. So, this is the general plan for the interior. Right here. Got the door. Uh, this is kind of the central beam. Right here, there's a post, and I didn't draw it in. But this is going to be a little, a little wall right here, uh, kind of setting apart the stove area. This is the wood stove. Uh, I'm not getting a propane stove. I'm not getting any of these appliances: washer, propane stove, fridge, freezer. But I'm going to be doing the not this not this trip. But in the future, I will probably at the beginning of next trip, you know, order these things. But for right now, what I'm going to be doing is, you know, make sure I got outlet, 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 water supply, water drain, uh, gas supply, and probably electrical. You know, I didn't even look at, you know, what I need for a stove. Kind of what this is going to be generally is... You know, you got like RV stoves and things, you know, like nice little four burner propane stoves. Or I'm guessing there are, they sell them. I haven't looked into this yet, you know, I'm going to look into it. You know, and then, you know, put in those fittings, you know, in this little wall right here. So that little wall is going to be kind of hiding that post. Um... Right now what I'm thinking is, here's the other post, doing the end wall. Right at this other post, and here's a little pony wall. So it'll be kind of a big open area right in here. Uh, no particular use, but in general, stacking firewood, you know. And then if I end up getting an animal and I need a place to put an animal, I can always keep an animal over here. Uh, this right here is going to be walk-in fridge, fridge slash freezer, uh, little door right there. This right here is going to be the panic room. There is no door to this. It's just kind of, it's going to be kind of a, this right here is going to be OSB sheathing, making up this right here. Uh, and this sheet of OSB uh is going to be uh something and something just a couple screws so if i need to get in there i can just take off those screws and get in there and basically when i'm out here i'll just be leaving that unscrewed but this is going to be kind of a 
uh, where I put my batteries and you know charge controller and all that jazz but then when I'm you know away you know like doing normal people living in the cities uh, for a few years I'll be putting like the generator and chop saw and you know those big tools in here uh, and then closing it up putting that piece of plywood on there so if someone breaks in they don't see all my good tools sitting around you know and just they go in through here and they see this this is gonna be lined with foam you know and then shelving rigid foam and then shelving to insulate it so they go in here they see that it goes back and then they don't think you know all the shelving and things kind of messes with their depth perception and they don't realize that it's missing four foot of depth you know and I may push this wall back further you know maybe go like bam 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 so I can make this bigger you know so it's less obvious to someone breaking in you know when they go in here they just see a solid wall when they're out here they just see solid walls when they go in here they see solid walls they don't realize that that this is my panic room slash safe fridge freezer living area uh, vanity kitchen sink so you know it's kind of crazy you having a kitchen sink and a vanity so close but the whole thing is you want a mirror for your vanity and you want good lighting for your uh, kitchen so you can see all the crud on your stuff and you know in first guest house I had vanity right in front of a window and then I did a little hinged mirror that was just kind of hokey <coughs> not good at all so you know if you want a mirror you can't have a window or if you want a window you can't have a mirror you know it's kind of a, having a mirror over here trying to like shave or something you know like you can't see it so you pretty much need that and then the tub uh, I'm not too sure what I'm doing here but this is right now what I'm looking at is a concrete counter uh, and this being extra wide your standard counter is like 26 inches or something your standard base cabinet is like 24 uh, you may get like a small vanity that's like 18 you know like these are typically 24 wide 24 deep 36 tall but some and you get vanities the same way but then you also sometimes get vanities that are 18 inches deep and like 30 inches tall like these little baby vanities which I don't really get but this would be kind of like a bar counter right now uh, the wood cook stove and this may end up being an oven or just firewood you know like put some firewood there and there or make it into like more of a this area into more of like a of an area where this is the heat source this wood cook stove wood stove you know not not a not an oven or anything it's just a little stove uh, but having the concrete counter extend out so I could sit on the bed here's the bed a little window uh, sit on the bed and use the bed you know for like a bar stool uh, and over here probably shelving just kind of like you know clothes shelves and things you know uh, metal shelving in here like that the two that I already got out here will be in here for the you know I like these metal shelves because they won't really grow mold you know so putting them in here but do other shelves, you know, so this is kind of like a pantry, firewood, miscellaneous, you know, tool area, you know. And then this would be kind of more pantry, you know, and storage and all that, you know, shelving, you know, shelving for clothes. You know, I could put the laptop here, computer here, you know, on this, you know, or in this kind of a 
shelving, you know, kind of like built-in book shelving. I have a desk kind of built into it, you know, something like that, you know, along this back wall. You know, there's no windows there, so it's a good wall for windows. This right here uh, is underground pretty much completely. So it's got the best natural insulation on the outside. And then this is going to be, you know, R13, R13 in these walls. And then a layer or two of rigid foam. You know, a layer everywhere is of rigid foam. And maybe a second layer of rigid foam over this, you know. And having like a rigid foam door insert kind of a thing, you know, like a door panel. Uh, let's, let's, let's see. Some shelving, you know, but I'm probably going to push this up. This one right here, how it goes like this, bring it over. So this will go up. That's kind of what I'm thinking now. And have this wall right here. So I have a bigger walk in fridge and freezer. So this is the general plan though. A uh, couple cabinets, uh, a washer. Uh, no dryer because there's no point in having a dryer it draws too much power I guess I could go with a propane dryer but why waste propane when it'll just dry on its own you know air dry uh, in the winter air dry somewhere near the stove uh, summer air dry outside or in this area just kind of see how it goes there's a window there for circulation better lighting you have know, four windows right in this area uh, so this right here is the drain so here's the face of the tub the front edge the left hand drain so the drain is on the left side uh, and that's where you got your mixer valve and all that jazz all your plumbing bits so this is gonna drain into this I may put this on a little pedestal to raise it up enough to get the p-trap in there and p-trap down but I have access to all the plumbing fittings back here so if I ever need to replace the mixer valve I can uh, do that without cutting out any drywall and this cabinet is gonna be a false wall underneath it you know so to get back here I can just pop out the bottom you know back of this cabinet you know, crawl under the cabinet, you know, through the cabinet to get into this void. So that cabinet, you know, squeeze around this plumbing or take out the P-trap, you know. And, uh, you know, get back here to do, you know, work on that, you know. If I need to do something with the drain line down in that hole, you know. Uh, so that's kind of the reason for this setup. Uh... You know, you kind of want a window in your thing so you can get good lighting and ventilation. A window for that, you know. Uh, I want the drain for this real close to that, you know. And, you know, these are like two foot. These drain lines are like 18 inches, 24 inches off the ground. You know, your standard sink drains. So, plenty of, plenty of uh, slope there. And the washer, you know, it's like two foot, maybe 30 inches off the ground, the drain for that. So, plenty of slope right there, you know. But the tub needs to be close, because either the tub needs to be close or the tub needs to be raised up, you know, to get slope on the drain. Uh, reason for the thing here is, here's where the floor drain is. So, kind of the general wet area, sink, sink, tub. You know, uh, here's the drain, you know, so it'll kind of flow into this drain, uh, that floor drain, it's in the concrete floor, uh, but I don't want to be walking on all this missloped stuff, you know, so it's kind of, I put a counter over that slopingness, you know, so most of the slope will be uh, covered by this counter so I won't really be feeling it you know uh, and there's the perimeter wall going around so these are two foot spacings 
these two by fours. Uh, let's see, uh, a little pony wall, you know, for the fridge. So this is uh, kind of your standard fridge, and then this is kind of like one of those flat on the ground freezers. Uh, so kind of, it doesn't get cold enough. This is December 9th. Oh, it's Monday. I did have a fire going. It's like 60 degrees out. And it was like 60 degrees pretty much all last night. Maybe 55. Just incredible weather. The last... This has been very nice weather. Uh, so... It's unrealistic to be able to put my water jugs outside and let them freeze over winter. So kind of that's what the freezer's for. I can put my water jugs in here, let them freeze, and then put them in here so they keep this area cold. So it's kind of like a, a walk-in freezer. Uh, which isn't important now, you know, but when you got like a Cooney Cooney pig or something and it's like a hundred pounds of meat, you know, or you kill a deer and it's like a hundred pounds of meat You know, you can only can so much of it, you know, to preserve it Can so much And then you need to uh, Do something with the rest, you know, uh, and that's what the freezers for freeze the rest Can what I can and freeze the rest and it's just good for like storing my apples and carrots, you know, uh, potatoes and such. Uh, yeah, so that's the this is the general plan and kind of the reasoning behind it. So this isn't the you know originally this was just gonna be a basement of storage, but now it's gonna be kind of a its own little unit, you know, and uh, you know it's still got general storage, like pantry storage, firewood storage, you know, freezer. Uh, and if I do a different thing or something, you know, this would be like a nice little guest unit, you know. Uh, fully livable, you know, or you always want a backup shelter, you know, if your primary house burns down, gets blown down, gets flooded, whatever, and then uh, you have nowhere to go. You know, you're just out in the woods. You know, so you always want a second place to go in case of emergencies, you know. So this could be a primary or this could be a secondary. But right now, it's going to be a primary. And pretty much my primary for, you know, a long time. You know, I may build another house on top of this one, you know. Like the pro house proper on top of it. Or just put the house proper in a different location, you know, on the property. So I got like this one in this side and then another one on the other end or something. Well, yeah, there's a good spot for another one on the other end, you know. But anyways, uh, that's a long time from now and I probably won't have the energy to do it. So basically, this this for the foreseeable future and probably most likely just for all future <laughs> will be kind of the setup. I don't want to get these appliances yet because it's too expensive for me to get them right now. I can't afford them. And then, uh, you know, I'll be leaving here in a few months. And chances are when I come back, this will be broken into and the appliances will be gone. You know, so it's kind of like get appliances, just have someone steal them. You know, it's kind of a uh, no thanks. You know, I might as well wait till I'm actually back out here, you know, for another two or three year stretch, you know, and get the appliances for that. Uh, propane stove is just, propane's like more convenient, you know, uh, I can do a direct flame on, you know, my pot or whatever, and the pot won't get sooty, you know, so, uh, what do you call it? 
I can do it quickly, cook quickly, because a direct flame really heats things up quickly. Uh, but without making a mess, you know. Uh, and I don't know what these stoves do, you know. Uh, you know, you're not supposed to burn propane inside, but these may be made to burn more efficient or something, or most likely you just put a hood, you know. So this stove is uh, the wood stove. We have vent out on this side. Uh, kind of, I'm thinking, wrap it in copper pipe, and that's my hot water. Uh, and then the hood for this stove, have it vent on this side. Of the, running along this beam, the side of this beam, you know. So this beam is like four foot over my head, you know. So it's kind of oh, and they're venting out this side of the gable end roof. Uh, so you know, the beam is out of the way. It's not going to be. These pipes won't be in the way, you know, the propane exhaust pipe going out this side. Uh, vent pipe, you know, just a regular hood, uh, stove hood, putting it over this one. Or, you know, this one wrapped in coil, copper, with water. So basically the water will come in. I'm thinking I'll have a T out here, main water coming in down the slope. Uh, a box at the top of the thing, teeing off. And one of those tea being my cold water in, and then the other one being a hot water in. And it's kind of like, well, I have it over here. Uh, so there'll be an outdoor, you know, kind of like a solar water heater, which I'm not too sure yet. You know, kind of, I got two general plans, you know. Uh,. Looking at getting some uh, scrap water heaters, you know, water heaters that have a bad heating element or something, you know, uh, but don't leak, you know, uh, and put one of those water heaters, stripping them down, so it's kind of like the base tank, you know, and uh, putting one of those water heaters over a wood, burning or wood burner, you know, so I just pile logs under and around it and burn it, you know, and it heats it up that way which would be good for getting copper coil is a few gallons you know but a uh, actual water heater that you're just putting a wood burner under you know that's 30 gallons you know that could heat up relatively quickly you know small water heater 30 gallon water heater uh, and the other one would be just having that exposed water heater to the sun you know for in the summertime the solar sun hitting it would heat up that metal of the water heater, you know, to plenty hot, you know, and I could throw a couple mirrors around it to direct more sun on it, you know, and that would heat up the water uh, to normal hot, you know, normal hot, you know, depending on the location maybe, you know, 123 degrees I think is the maximum allowed, you know, at least in the Seattle area it was, 123, you could set your water heater too. Uh, but those two, you know, something like that out here. So the water, the cold water will split the hot water line, do whatever that outside water heater is, and then continue to this side right here. So I made this burned wood stove to heat up the water, you know, or, you know, in the winter I may not want to burn stuff out here for this outside water heater. I'll just burn stuff in here, and I got my... 10 gallons of hot water or whatever from that copper coil so kind of teeing off out here coming in you know going around this exhaust pipe and then you know to this one to that one to this one you know oh and to the washer uh so that's the general plan and the reasonings behind it and it's raining right now but this is Part one. Uh, my water jug collection. I'm thinking, depending on their condition, because uh, they break down in the UVs like crazy. UVs break down clear plastic, nothing else.
Give them some salt water. It's nice having a emergency water on hand. But then uh, emergency water, you know, you kind of freeze it. It thaws at 32, so you know when it thaws that it's time to place it. But with salt, I can get it down to like 30 and it'll melt or something. So this video is going to be floating the floor. You can't really tell. But the floor has been floated. This half has been floated. Floating this half of the floor. You know, I haven't done that yet. i got to move that stuff over. Uh, part one, floating the floor. This is a rough float, but it's a tileable float. At this point, I can tile it. Giving it some... Uh, and it's kind of just a mix of cement and stuff. That, some sand. Uh, going, uh, that's sealer. Dry lock. It's kind of just, you know. It's all about water control, keeping things dry, managing the moisture, uh, sealed with the tar on the outside, sealed with the dry lock on the inside, uh, drain line, you know, it's got a little groove on the perimeter, uh, so... Hopefully that groove, you know, and that groove goes over to the floor drain, which is kind of under the cement. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, coming in. There's the perimeter wall. Uh, this wall right here, the back wall of the freezer wall. This is the, I'm standing in the freezer right now. That's 62. Not even a hundred yet. Nice. Humidity. Uh, this back wall of the freezer stands out. Uh, probably about two inches or something. So, well, maybe four inches away from this wall. You know, so it would be like right here. And I can curve my, get some elbows for my pipes and my electricals, you know. Uh, the rest of this behind this 2x4 wall, uh, give that some insulation. Inside the 2x4 wall, more insulation. And then on the, you know, freezer side, more insulation. Uh, here's kind of, you know, this wall. This will be a wall that goes that way. Uh, uh, this is a general open area, and I was gonna have this wall continue straight over to BAM, but I'm thinking now extend it up three foot to like right about there, and then you know, so it'll be like a zigzag going over, up, and over. I think that's what I like. I don't need all of that for living space, you know, and that's kind of the living space over there the vanity, the kitchen sink, the shower. Ooh, whatever else, you know, right over there will be the stove, wood stove, right there will be the propane stove, the bed, and things, you know. So, like, right here will be the uh, panic room and the freezer. Easy peasy. Uh, oh. I yeah, so, but this video, doing the floor, doing the primer, or not primer, sealer. Uh, and I'm putting in, you know, about half of the insulation. Still got to do that half over there. Uh, part two, be taking, like, half of that framing and framing out this area. Kind of, uh where I can, you know, uh, and then moving everything over against that framed out stuff, you know, and framing out, you know, floating this area, priming it, or sealing it, 
framing it. Uh, that's the tub. It's a really nice tub. 32 inch. That's pretty deep. Wait, is it 32 deep? It's one of the deeper ones. Uh, but in general, oh, here we are. So it's 12 and a half deep. The tub's actual water zone, but it's 18 inches like this. So there's like five and a half inches between the bottom of the tub and kind of the floor line. So there's five and a half inches to maybe squeeze in the P-trap and uh, drain line, you know, drain line will be going in there. Uh, tubs take a two inch drain. Kitchen sink takes an inch and a half drain. Tub takes a two inch drain. Uh, vanity is kind of odd. A vanity sink is an inch and a quarter drain, but you always put it into an inch and a half drain in the wall. So they make these little, you know, compression collars that are adapters that go from the inch and a quarter vanity to the inch and a half actual drain. I don't get why they make inch and a quarter vanity drains. It should just be inch and a half. Uh, it's a two inch for the washer, two inch drain for the washer. And kind of, you know, there's a level of plumbing beyond me, but plumbing lines, drain lines, have capacity limits and water fixtures have units of capacity, kind of like that. Uh, you know, like a Vanity sink is maybe one unit, you know. A two inch, I think, can maybe hold nine units or something. So you could have like nine sinks running, you know. That might be two units, you know, a kitchen sink, you know. So maybe like four kitchen sinks running, you know. A drain, you know, tub, you know, with the full water just coming, you know, out the thing, not out the shower, but just out the thing. That might be like four units so you could have two tubs but like a, a washer because it when it drains it pushes the water out I think it's a full nine units you know so you 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 know it actually needs a uh, two inch drain you know and while that water from the tub or water from the washer is being drained uh, you know, if I'm running this or running that or running the other thing, it'll back up that two inch line or it could back up the two inch line, you know, which is normally why you have like a three inch drain, you know, main drain, like a two inch drain, maybe like nine units and a three inch drain, like 27 units, you know, because it's just the cubic nature of it. But yeah, just some interesting plumbings, uh, not necessarily needed to know, but you wouldn't really think plumbing was that in depth, but it was. You know, when you're designing for a house like this, it doesn't matter. But when you're kind of designing the plumbing layout for like an apartment building, where you have 50 units or something, you know, you need to know the capacities of you know the where you need to make your step up your three inch drain to a four inch drain, where you step up your four to a six. You know, kind of you know you need to know that then. Yeah, so this will be uh, uh, finishing it's interior part one. It's for foreign nationals who come to the U.S. for military training. And Pierce Bobby Allen has more. Federal investigators are trying to determine what motivated the military student to carry out the rampage inside of a Pensacola Naval Base classroom on Friday. <laughs> Secretary Mark Esper said on Fox News that incident is also prompting a review of how foreign nationals are vetted before coming to the U.S. for military training. My understanding is currently, of course, they're reviewed by the Department of State, they're reviewed by the Department of Homeland Security, and they are reviewed by us. And I want to make sure that those, those procedures are full and sufficient. The Pentagon has long allowed military officers from other countries to train in the U.S. Defense officials have defended the exchanges as investigators examine how the program screens foreign officers. The Navy has identified the three victims who were killed trying to stop the gunmen. 
Bobby Allen, NPR News, Washington. The House Judiciary Committee holds an impeachment hearing tomorrow into President Trump's dealings with Ukraine to review evidence compiled by the House Intelligence Committee. Lawyers for both Republicans and Democrats will present their cases. Afterward, the committee will decide whether it should move forward with articles of impeachment. In Hong Kong, tens of thousands of demonstrators marched through the streets today in the first authorized pro-democracy rally in more than two months. NPR's Emily Fang has more. Marchers dressed in black, the chosen color of protest, and others in more colorful winter clothing streamed into Hong Kong's commercial district by the thousands. They shouted slogans like Hong Kong revenge and called on the city's leader, Carrie Lam, to step down. Anti-government protests are now in their sixth month. Despite the withdrawal of an extradition bill that initially sparked the protests, demonstrations have expanded into greater calls for direct democracy, rule of law, and greater autonomy from Beijing. The march coincides with the United Nations Human Rights Day and is the largest the city has seen in months. Emily Fang, NPR News, Beijing. Business economists are forecasting economic growth to slow slightly this year and next but say they think the economy will not fall into recession. The latest survey of 53 forecasters with the National Association for Business Economics shows expected growth of 2.9% to slow to 2.8% this year and then down to 1.8% in 2020. This is NPR. In India, at least 43 people are dead after a fire swept through a handbag factory in a congested New Delhi neighborhood. Authorities say an electrical short appears to be the cause and are investigating whether the factory was operating legally. The owner has been detained. The Kennedy Center hands out its annual awards honoring excellence in the arts tonight. Linda Ronstadt, Sally Field, and the producers of Sesame Street are among the honorees, as are Earth, Wind, and Fire and Michael Tilson. Thomas, and here's Elizabeth Blair, reports. Honoree Michael Tilson Thomas leads orchestras around the world and champions American composers, like conducting works by Aaron Copeland. Sesame Street is the first TV program to receive the award. The Kennedy Center says the show continues to revolutionize how viewers learn about the world. And Earth, Wind, and Fire is being honored for songs that have bridged generations. The weekend for honorees includes a dinner at the State Department and a star-studded show of tributes at the Kennedy Center. Elizabeth Blair, NPR News, Washington. SpaceX's Dragon capsule made a delivery to the International Space Station today, delivering mice, pest-killing worms, and a smart and empathetic robot, among other things. But there was also holiday cheer. NASA says nestled into the three tons of supplies were Christmas presents. This is SpaceX's 19th supply run to the orbiting outpost. Asian markets are trading higher at this hour. The Asia Dow is up about one-third of a percent. I'm Janine Herbst, and you're listening to NPR News from Washington. Support for NPR comes from the George Lucas Educational Foundation, creator of Edutopia, an online resource dedicated to improving the learning experience for America's students with information and strategies about what works in K-12 education. Learn more at edutopia.org. A taser is a weapon designed to stun a suspect. It's the most complicated thing a cop has on his or her belt. But in police departments across America, tasers aren't always living up to their promise. So, so me watching this guy um, being tased and walking towards us, swinging a knife at us, um, shocked me. On the next reveal. Your reveal tonight at 8. From NPR, this is Hidden Brain. I'm Shankar Vedantam. Morgan Smalley has been performing with an improv comedy troupe since she was in college. Look at me on page four. I, I, somehow my tongue left my mouth. <laughs> After dozens of performances, she's learned that you need more than a creative mind to get the audience laughing. You also need to be a good listener. That means not just hearing what people say. You have to pick up on everything that surrounds the words. Like, let's say I came out, and instead of saying, happy birthday, like, with a happy face, I could be like, happy birthday, and clearly that means that I'm upset. And then we'd go from there, like, why am I mad at them? Is it that when it was my birthday last time, they treated me like garbage? Things like that. Morgan prides herself on being able to pick up on subtext, on being able to read between the lines, behind the lines. When she does that well, 
she can hear the results immediately. <laughs> when you get the laugh, it's just like such a self-esteem boost. <laughs> it's like instant validation. And instantly exhilarating. That's how she felt at a recent show. I was like a slug on stage. I like got on the floor and I like acted like a slug. I inchwormed across the stage. Her fellow actors lit up. The audience exploded in laughter. When Morgan walked out of the theater that night, she was practically bursting. I just needed to do something with my energy. Like, I, I didn't want to just go home and, like, go to sleep. I want to do something. Just then... This guy, like, walked out of nowhere. He was carrying a tripod and a bunch of other stuff. And he was just like, does anybody want to buy this tripod? And I was like... Yeah, I want to buy this tripod. I think I could get a lot of use out of a tripod. I was like, how much? And he said, $25. And also, I'm going to give you this $50 Amazon gift card. And I was like, okay, a tripod and a $50 Amazon gift card for $25. Wow, this guy is so cool. I'm totally going to do that. The high she felt from inchworming across the stage just got even higher. Morgan walked with a guy to an ATM. I got my money in 20s. So I, I had to either give him $20 or $40. She asked if she could give him $20 rather than the full 25. He was like, you give me whatever you want to give me. And I was like, you're so cool. I'm going to give you $40. So I gave him $40. And then he gave me, like, a shoebox full of other random things. And I was like, he's so cool. Morgan felt like she had hit the jackpot. There was a loofah in there. There was a bunch of pens. And I got really excited about the pens because, I don't know, I just love pens. Like, stress balls in there. There was, like, a diamond cleaner. I have never heard of a diamond cleaner before, but it's got, like, bristles at the end and, like, this juice on the inside. Um, what else is in there? craft supplies. And he also threw in... A pair of women's shoes. They weren't my size, but I was like, I can sell those. This is awesome. Morgan couldn't wait to show her roommates the loot. She burst into her apartment and told them about her unbelievable good fortune. They were like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> they were like, okay, what this guy did is he took the stuff out of cars that weren't locked and then he sold it to you for money. I was like... No! No, he was so nice. He said he was moving. He was getting rid of the shoes. He said they were his girlfriend's shoes. He said he was distancing himself from technology. That's why he couldn't use the gift card. And slowly, like, my, my universe just, like, unraveled. And I was like, no! I just bought a bunch of stolen stuff. Why did Morgan, who prides herself on being able to read subtext and situations, fail to see what seemed obvious to her friends? I like to think of myself as like a pretty logical person. But in that moment, I didn't have any logic. Like, I wasn't questioning the situation. I was just being super impulsive. And so yeah, in that way, I think I was being a pretty different person. It's as if there are two people within Morgan and neither understands the other. Logical Morgan thinks impulsive Morgan made a glaring mistake. But impulsive Morgan is just as bewildered by logical Morgan. Who would pass up a deal like this? This week on Hidden Brain, we explore how certain situations cause us to become strangers to ourselves. I definitely didn't maintain cool and calm my entire body froze i was just an absolute blubbering mess i became <laughs> filled with anger and i just kind of lost it and we look at the deep psychological mystery that occurs during these moments no matter how many times we discover the strangers living inside us the next time always catches us by surprise Quick heads up, 
This episode contains stories about sex, sex work, and sexual harassment. The Pittsburgh area is home to some of the steepest hills in America. George Lowenstein used to run these hills every week with his friend Jules. We would get absolutely exhausted on the way up and be feeling very, very miserable. On the way up to the peak, all he could think of was the pain. But moments later... It was all forgotten within maybe 10, 20 seconds. The more George thought about it, the more it seemed like a puzzle. As he was climbing the hill, the idea of relief was inconceivable. The pain felt endless. But the moment he crested the hill, the pain faded so quickly that in his memory, it hadn't been so bad. A few days later, he would lace up his shoes and go running with Jules again. It occurred to George that this gap in perception was psychologically important and applied to more than just the pain of running. I realized that when you're not in pain or cold or experiencing a powerful emotion like anger or fear, it's very difficult to imagine yourself in that situation. There is a reason this happens. Emotions completely transform us as people. So when we're in one emotional state, it's as if we're a different person um, than we are when we're in a different emotional state. George has thought about this phenomenon a lot. As a professor of psychology and economics at Carnegie Mellon University, he has conducted dozens of studies to understand how our emotional states affect us. One of his earliest studies involved ice water. My colleague wanted to be the guinea pig for the studies, um, and you're supposed to put your hand in the cold water for like a minute. He put his hand in the cold water, and 20 seconds later, he pulled it out. And then a minute later, he said, that's ridiculous. I can do it, because he couldn't remember the pain anymore. Expecting fully that he would be able to sustain the minute in the cold water. And then about 20 seconds later, he pulled his hand out again. It was just like what George experienced on his runs. As soon as his colleague pulled his hand out of the freezing water, it was like he was struck with amnesia. George came up with a name for what was happening. The hot, cold empathy gap. Usually, when we think about empathy, we think about how we relate to other people. George's insight is that we regularly lack empathy for ourselves when we are in a different emotional state. When we're angry, we can't imagine being calm. When we are tranquil, it's hard to imagine being so angry that we could hurt someone. The hot-cold empathy gap can also be caused by physiological states. When we are really hungry, all our resolutions about healthy eating evaporate. When we are full, it's easy to forget what it felt like to be hungry. We imagine that we will stick to salads the next time. The hot and cold in the hot-cold empathy gap are a shorthand. They describe strong emotional and physiological states. When we're in a cold state, we're logical, deliberate. When we're in a hot state, our emotions overtake us. Morgan Smalley was in a hot state when a young man sold her a sack of random stuff. In her excitement, her skepticism failed to kick in. Another familiar hot state? Sexual arousal. Can I talk about that on NPR? Like, I don't know. <laughs> the answer is yes. So parents of young children, here's your warning. When Irene Pemberton was in middle school, she devoted as much time to sex ed as her classmates may have spent hanging out at the mall. Every Sunday evening for about a year, her parents drove her to a Unitarian church for a two-hour session. We learned everything, you know, like they had like the condoms, you know, putting on bananas kind of deal. Irene's family also spoke frankly about sex. Like the time in high school when Irene got an IUD and had a conversation about it with her mom. I just remember her saying that I still have to use condoms and, you know, to still be careful. In other words, Irene received an unusually candid, comprehensive sex education. All those hours sitting on church couches and talking to her family made her confident that she'd make good decisions when it came to sex. I was like, well, obviously. 
obviously I would use condoms, like, if I didn't, like, know the person very well. And I probably was like, I would do it every time. And she did. That is, until she met one special suitor. We, like, hung out, had dinner and stuff, and then, like, go back to his place. And, um, so I'm not the type of person that is just, like, carrying around condoms all the time. And he is the type of person that never uses condoms. That was really annoying for me, but I was just like, like the conversation did not happen until we were already getting intimate. This is what all her years of sex ed training had prepared her for. I'm like, oh, you don't have condoms, okay. In hindsight, Irene realizes this was exactly the situation that called for condoms. Definitely, the type of people that never use condoms are probably the type of people that you should use condoms with, in my opinion, at least, because they don't ever use condoms. But in that moment, a different line of reasoning went through her head. I can either choose to not have intercourse. That was not what I really wanted to do. It didn't sound as fun or like do something else sexual that still just like would not be my top choice or just have unprotected sex. And so I was like, this is gonna be okay, like just this one time and it's like not a big deal and it'll be fine. And so then I did that. It's a perfect illustration of an empathy gap. This is psychologist George Lowenstein again. When you listen to her description of what happened, it's a very kind of clinical description because she, when she was talking to you, she wasn't in an aroused state. So she was talking to you as if she was really making a decision when probably in the heat of the moment she was just kind of swept up in the course of things. Irene wasn't thinking back to what her mom said about condoms. She also wasn't thinking about what she just learned in class on the history of the AIDS epidemic. Hot state Irene didn't say what cold state Irene would have predicted she would say. No one has to have sex. So I would have just said, okay, another time. I asked Irene if she felt pressured into having sex. I really wanted to do it, so I feel like it was fully my choice. It was a good time, aside from me feeling like, like, geez, I shouldn't have done the, you know, unprotected sex part. Once the night was over, it wasn't long before cool-headed Irene reappeared. She was reading for class about the risks of unprotected sex and HIV. So, like, my brain immediately is like, oh, my God, I have made a mistake. This is the one time you have unprotected sex. Like, it could be, like, really bad or something like that. Three days after that first date, she went out again with the same guy. Before the date, Irene clearly told herself what would happen and what would not. Going into it, I was like, not tonight. I'm not going to... I'm not going to have unprotected sex tonight. And then I go and hang out with him, and I'm really distracted. The problem was, cold state Irene had not anticipated how hot state Irene would act again. I still did not bring condoms, and I made the same choice. Although that time I was like, well, you know... That was like three days ago, and nothing bad has happened yet from that. So maybe just one more time. Just like Morgan Smalley can't understand why she trusted a guy selling random things on the street, Irene doesn't recognize the person who made these impulsive decisions. I was telling my friend about this, and I'm like, I don't know that girl. <laughs> like, I don't know her. <laughs> George Lowenstein is sympathetic to Irene. Sexual arousal can lead people to do things they would never expect. Downplay risks, rationalize behavior, and come up with excuses. Things that make people wake up the next day and go, Oh no, what did I do? Beyond having unprotected sex with a date, sexual arousal can also drive more troubling behavior. Years ago, George ran experiments where men were given different scenarios to imagine. In one study, they went on a date with a woman named Susan, and things were going well on the date. At some point, they're kind of on the verge of getting into more serious physical things, and Susan says she wants to stop. 
and we ask people, what would you do in this situation? The studies put some men into a state of sexual arousal. In one experiment, the men were shown pictures of nude women. In all the studies, a control group featured men who were not sexually aroused. George found that sexually aroused men were more likely to say they would encourage a woman to drink to increase her willingness to have sex. They were more likely to say they would be willing to slip a drug into her drink. They also said that if she resisted them, they would be less likely to take no for an answer. Did men realize how their behavior changed as a result of the intervention? In one experiment, George had men get sexually aroused, but then brought them back to the lab the following day. <coughs> These men had time to cool down. We actually got a surprising result in that condition. The surprising result was that the men in this condition didn't just say they would respect the woman's boundaries. They indicated they would be even more mindful of consent than the men who had not been aroused. George doesn't know exactly why they got this result, but he has a guess. They can't remember that how aroused they were, so they think, oh, you know, I saw these scantily clad women and I wasn't very aroused, so probably I behaved really well on the date. George and other researchers have repeatedly found that people are worse at predicting their behavior in a hot state after they've already experienced that hot state. These findings show the hot-cold empathy gap works in two directions across time. First, we're not great at predicting how we'll behave in a different emotional state. That's a prospective empathy gap. But we also have trouble understanding our actions in the past. Our memories are faulty, especially when it comes to how intense feelings can overwhelm us. Think about George's colleague, who couldn't remember how painful it felt just one minute earlier to have his hand submerged in icy water. So that's a retrospective empathy gap. Irene's story shows both these gaps. Before she was aroused, Irene was certain she could apply everything she had been taught by church leaders about unsafe sex. But soon after her date, cold state Irene could no longer put herself back into the shoes of hot state Irene. I don't know that girl. <laughs> this incomprehension led her to feel confident about how she would behave on her next day. She forgot that hot state Irene would not be able to access her cold state logic. This is true not just for sexual arousal. It's true for hunger, pain, addiction, depression. If you are not depressed and your friend tells you, oh, I feel really depressed, you might say, oh, that's really terrible, I feel really sorry for you. But if you're not depressed yourself, it's really very, very difficult to imagine what they're going through. This gets at one of the most troubling consequences of the hot-cold empathy gap. Not only does it keep us from understanding ourselves, it can keep us from understanding other people. I'm Shankar Vedantan, and you're listening to Hidden Brain. This is NPR. It's the time of year we celebrate the things for which we're grateful. This might be the first moment you've had to reflect on how WKMS affects your life. Celebrate your radio companion with a donation of $100, $50, or any amount that's right for you. Visit WKMS.org. Just click the donate button, and as a bonus, your gift will be matched by Pepper's Automotive Group. But don't wait. Do your part now, and thanks. Support comes from sustaining members and Purchase Area Family Magazine, sharing articles, ideas, and regional events with readers bi-monthly. The December-January issue is now available for pickup throughout the Purchase Area and for viewing online. You're listening to Murray State's 91.3 WKMS. Radio supported by its listeners. Join in with your gift today at WKMS.org. Support for NPR comes from this station and from C3.ai. C3.ai software enables organizations to use artificial intelligence at enterprise scale, solving previously unsolvable business problems. Learn more at C3.ai. From the Arcus Foundation, 
dedicated to the idea that people can live in harmony with one another and the natural world. Learn more about Arcus and its partners at arcusfoundation.org. And from the sustaining members of this NPR station. This is Hidden Brain. I'm Shankar Vedantam. A reminder, this episode contains stories about sex, sex work, and sexual harassment. Feelings like hunger, thirst, and anger can cause us to act impulsively. When we are in these hot states, we can say and do and think things that we never imagined possible, even minutes earlier. But sometimes hot states don't get us fired up. They paralyze us. This can be true for emotions like embarrassment or shame or fear. Nina Fuller learned this decades ago. She was in her early 20s, studying art at George Washington University. Both she and her husband needed part-time jobs to pay for school. She found a listing for a job in the classified section of the newspaper. I saw this ad that said, be a masseuse, no experience necessary. It was a way to earn money, and she'd get trained on the job. Nina called the number. She was given a date and time to show up. I put my hair in the little braids and drove myself to this place and walked in. The space Nina entered looked like the waiting room of a dentist's office. Nina checked in. And, and somebody told me to take my hair out of the braids. I'm like, why would I do that? You know, and they were like, well, I remember they said, you know, these guys that come here, they're going home to their wives and they, they have high stressful jobs and they want to relax before they go home. I'm like, oh, all right, you know. There were other women in the room. They looked about the same age as her. The women were asked to line up, side by side. Behind them, there were doors to massage rooms. I figured, okay, the guys come in, they, they pick the women and go into the room and get a massage. A man wearing a suit came in and chose Nina. She walked into one of the rooms with him. He took his clothes off. Then I gave him a massage. I mean, I, how would I even know how to do that? I don't know. I just figured what, what you know, made it up as I went along. That on-the-job training she expected to get never happened. And then he rolled over. And I'm alone in this room with this guy. And he, he rolled over, and he had an erection. And I was just, what? I mean, it, it wasn't until that point that I thought, oh, what, what have I gotten myself into? You know, like, what the hell? Nina says the man made it clear to her that he expected more than a massage. He must have said, this is why I'm here. This is what you do. I mean, I, I, and I think I was probably thinking, how could I not have known that? How, how, what? You know, what, oh, oh. The man told Nina he expected an intimate massage. She gave in. This is the thing that I've wondered for all these years. Like, if there was a, an essay question, or there was a multiple choice question, and it was like, okay, this happened, and these, these are the choices. You stay, and you, and you do what that man wants. You, you say, no, I'm not doing that. What are you, nuts? You leave. You get, go walk out, get in your car, and drive home. I would have probably have checked. I walk out, and I get in my car, and I drive home. But definitely. But that's not what I did. Nina not only didn't drive off, she stayed on the job. I completed my shift, which is the part that's like, what, what, what in me, what in my brain, I mean, what in my whole being made me think I needed to complete that shift? I don't, I don't know that. Nina says she doesn't remember whether she gave any more massages that day. The rest of that evening is a blank. But the one thing she does remember is that she stayed for the whole shift. I asked her why she felt compelled to stay when she herself would have predicted she would do otherwise. I think I was just embarrassed to, to think that I had didn't know what was going on. And, and sort of getting, getting your bag and walking out would have meant what? Would have said what? 
that I had put myself in a situation that I didn't, that I had no idea what was going on when I got there. And that, and that would mean what? Maybe that would mean that I was stupid. And, you know, maybe I didn't want to appear as naive and dumb as I felt at that moment. Like, everyone else that was there knew what they were doing and why they were there. Yeah, maybe I didn't want to. I don't know. Maybe I didn't want to appear stupid. I think that's a very common response, that people say, yeah, I went through with it because clearly I should have asked more on the front end, and I didn't, and I didn't want to look like I didn't know what I was doing, so you just go through with it. This is psychologist Julie Woodsicker. I am a professor at Washington Lee University. Julie has spent years studying how people react in situations like the one Nina found herself in. Many of these people ask themselves the same questions. Why didn't I speak up? Why didn't I protest? Why did I go through with it? Some of Julie's earliest thoughts on sexual harassment and abuse came together when she was a college student. Like millions of others, she witnessed the tectonic event in 1991 that brought the term sexual harassment into popular use. It was the Senate testimony of law professor Anita Hill. She claimed Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas had sexually harassed her while he was her supervisor. After a brief discussion of work, he would turn the conversation to a discussion of sexual matters. Before an all-male judiciary committee, she alleged he had made sexual advances and told explicit jokes. He commented on what I was wearing in terms of whether it made me more or less sexually attractive. He talked about pornographic materials. On several occasions, Thomas told me graphically of his own sexual prowess. The nation was wrapped and divided. I remember really, really um, vividly people saying, like, no, she's lying. She's got to be lying. There was one specific detail that led many people to that conclusion. After Anita Hill allegedly experienced harassment, she was given an opportunity to work for Clarence Thomas again. She took it. During the hearings, Senator Alan Simpson pressed her on this point. If what you say this man said to you occurred, why in God's name, when he left his position of power or status or authority over you, and you left it in 1983, why in God's name would you ever speak to a man like that the rest of your life? That's a very good question. And I'm sure that I can't not answer that to your satisfaction. That is one of the things that I have tried to do today. I have suggested that I was afraid of retaliation. I was afraid of damage to my professional life. And I believe you have to understand that this response and, that, and that's one of the things that I have come to understand about harassment, that this response, this kind of response, is not atypical. And I can't explain. It takes, it takes an expert in psychology to explain how that can happen. But it can happen, because it happened to me. By the early 2000s, Julie had become one of those experts in psychology. She and her collaborator, Marianne LaFrance, found themselves talking about how people reacted to Anita Hill's testimony. We noticed a lot of people said, I never would have responded that way if I had been sexually harassed. I would have, like, I would have told them to stop, and I probably would have left the job. I definitely would have followed him to another job. Julie realized some of the most important questions about sexual harassment had not been studied at all. There was a lot on how women remembered responding, and there was a good amount on how they anticipated they would respond. But there was nothing at that point on looking at how women actually responded. Julie set out to understand how women react to sexual harassment as it's happening. In the first phase of the study... We had roughly 200 women come into the lab, and we gave them a scenario that they needed to read through. Here's the scenario. You're interviewing for a job as a research assistant. The interviewer is in his mid-30s. Um, you're in an office alone with him, and, you know, after initial greeting, he starts asking you some questions. They're standard interview questions. 
until this one. Do you have a boyfriend? A few questions later, do people find you desirable? The interview continues. Then he asks, do you think it's important for women to wear bras to work? Remember, this is a job interview. The women who participated in Julie's study imagined the situation and were asked to describe how they thought they'd react. The response was overwhelming. About 90% of the women thought that they would respond in a very assertive and sometimes aggressive way. So about 60% said that they would confront assertively, that they would say to him, that's inappropriate, you shouldn't ask those questions. About 30% said that they would leave the interview or that they would often say, I'd tell them off or I'd slap them and then leave. Besides confronting the interviewer and leaving the interview, many participants said they'd do something else. 68% of all respondents said that they would refuse to answer at least one of those three questions. The women were not only asked to predict what they'd do, but to describe the emotion they would feel. A lot of women, about 30%, said that they would feel anger. Women who predicted they'd be angry were more likely to say they'd confront the interviewer. Anger was galvanizing. We were interested in fear, too. How many people thought they'd be a little bit afraid? And only 2% of people said that they would be afraid. And fear was not correlated with confronting. So this doesn't sound like Nina Fuller at all. These women were all assertive, angry, indignant. They were sure they would tell the man off. In the second part of the study, Julie set up an experiment to test whether women actually did what they forecast they would do. We had 50 women who were applying for a job. The job was a research assistant in a lab. The women would come into the interview, and we had covert cameras set up. Their interviewer was a man in his mid-30s. He asked those three questions. The same three questions from the first phase of the study. Do you have a boyfriend? Do people find you desirable? Do you think it's important for women to wear bras to work? What was different here was that the women weren't imagining a job interview. They were in a job interview, or so they believed. So how did they react? Did 90% respond assertively? Tell the interviewer off? Slap him and walk out? Nobody left. Every single person answered every single question. Some women did speak up, but generally not until the end of the interview. 36% of the participants at that point said very politely, yeah, I was just wondering, you know, why did you ask about me being desirable? There was another important difference between the women's responses in the two parts of the study. So you remember in the anticipated study, most women responded that they'd be angry, very few fearful. And it was the flip in this study. So we found that many women reported feeling afraid in that situation, and anger was not very much reported. While the women who imagined being sexually harassed thought they'd be angry, and that anger would propel them to act, women who were face-to-face -face with a harasser in fact experienced fear. There's clearly an aspect of the study that should make you uneasy. Researchers brought in unsuspecting women for what they thought were job interviews and then subjected them to harassment to see how they would behave. Julie went through rigorous ethical clearance to conduct the study. After it was over, she debriefed the volunteers and gave them the option of pulling their data. What explains the enormous gap between what women think they do and what they actually do? When we're asked to anticipate how we would respond, we don't take into account, one, how our emotional state in that moment, especially if it's a highly charged moment, will impact our behavior. We're not thinking about how being in a hot state might affect us. We also don't understand very well, I think, the strength of the situation and just what would be the cost of leaving, um, how would people perceive us. They're not thinking about how they're going to be feeling. They're not thinking about even really the other people in the situation. They're just thinking about what would they do. It's like wanting to build a house and showing up to the groundbreaking with only a sketch. A sketch that doesn't take into consideration any of the context or any of the obstacles, like the engineering requirements or the zoning laws or the funding. If you had outlined the scenario that Nina Fuller found herself in, she would have told you ahead of time that she would have walked out of the massage parlor. 
What she would not have been able to factor into her thinking was the change in her emotional state, her surprise, her fear, her shock, and how those emotions might have affected her ability to act. You know, if you were to think about that, you would say, oh, I'd be so mad. I'd be so mad at that guy. Like, what's he thinking? But in actuality, she's alone in a room with a guy. She doesn't really know, like, what this whole situation is, except that she's been hired to give a massage, and she has no experience doing that. And she's probably feeling afraid. She's not feeling angry. One thing to confront someone turns out to be just one step in actually confronting someone, and it is not even the first step. First, you have to interpret that something happened that actually is sexual harassment. Then you have to interpret the event as confrontation worthy. So is this event worthy of confrontation or is it really not that big of a deal? Then you have to actually take responsibility to confront. Then you have to come up with different response options. What am I actually going to do? And then you actually have to do it. So when most people think about confrontation, they think about it being just one step. You know, I'm either going to confront or I'm not going to confront. I'm going to ask it, you know, someone to make it stop or I won't. But in actuality, it's five pretty separate big steps that you have to take to be able to confront at the end. Listening to George Lowenstein and Julie Woodsicker made me think about sexual harassment prevention programs. Many of these programs try to address the abuse of power that drives so much sexual harassment. But many also ignore the hot, cold empathy gap. The advice given to participants is respect other people's boundaries. Don't say and do things you would later regret. People listening might think, sure, that's easy. They're in a cold state, and they can't imagine how sexual arousal can turn them into the kind of people who violate boundaries or make colleagues uneasy. The training programs also tell potential victims and bystanders, don't be silent. Report problems. If you see something, say something. People listening think, of course I would never be silent in a situation like that. They go back to their desks with the feeling that they know exactly how they would act in these situations. The hot cold empathy gap doesn't just make us draw the wrong conclusions about our actions and motivations. It can make us unfairly judgmental toward others. We hear what someone else did, someone like Anita Hill, and think, I would never have done that. I would have acted differently. It's very difficult to make sense of other people's behavior, people who are acting under the influence of emotions that you're not experiencing. George Lewinstein says our unrealistic sense of how we would act is at the root of our failure to understand others. When we assess whether another person's actions are reasonable, we first imagine how we would behave in that situation. The problem is, our perceptions are out of whack with reality. We think we'd be able to control an addiction, or slog through pain, or confront a harasser. When we come back, we may never be able to avoid the hot cold empathy gap, but there are ways to compensate for it. I was like, I don't know if this is worth it. You know, my, my legs hurt, my body hurts. I just want to go home and go to sleep right now. I'm Shankar Vedantam, and you're listening to Hidden Brain. This is NPR. Did you ever wonder where we come from and where we're going? I think we already are a different species. We've supersized our diets. We have eradicated certain diseases. We're putting more data into our brains in one day than we used to put in a lifetime. I'm Guy Raz, the source of everything, our origins and our future. Next time on the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Hear the TED Radio Hour tonight at 7. Support comes from the UPS stores of Murray and Paducah, wishing everyone happy holidays. They offer everything needed to help pack and ship gifts this holiday season. Open 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday and 9 to 3 on Saturdays. The UPS stores of Murray and Paducah are thankful for another great year and offer best wishes to all in 2020. You're listening to Murray State's 91.3 WKMS. Become a sustaining member at WKMS.org. Support for NPR comes from this station and from the NPR Wine Club. 
where every bottle tells a story and NPR shows become wines like Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me Pinot Noir, available to adults 21 years or older. Learn more at nprwineclub.org. From Kay Buxbaum, in support of the David Gilkey and Zabiula Tamana Memorial Fund, established to strengthen NPR's commitment to training and protecting journalists in high-risk environments. And from the listeners who support this NPR station. This is Hidden Brain. I'm Shankar Vedantan. All of us see and do things we would never anticipate saying and doing. When we're in the thrall of intense emotions, we are impulsive when we should be cautious. We freeze when we think we will be brave. When we look back on our behavior, we are often baffled because we have forgotten how we felt in the heat of the moment. Psychologist George Lowenstein calls this an empathy gap. We often can't relate to the other person we become in a different emotional state. We might think that one way to bridge this gap is to see how we behave when we are in the grip of an intense emotion. Surely, after we see how we act in one of these emotional states, we won't be as naive the next time around. We think experience functions like a powerful vaccine, once inoculated, forever protected. All my research suggests that experiencing something yourself does not provide any inoculation against the empathy gap. If experience was a simple fix, George's colleague wouldn't have believed he'd be able to keep his hand in ice water the second time around. Irene would not have had unprotected sex twice. Most of us don't even get to the point where we recognize how different our hot and cold selves are. But even if we did, that would not be enough to change our behavior. We have to develop the muscle memory to override our instincts in those states. George has found an effective way to do so. Training. Well, I think what training often does is it diminishes the hot state. So, for example, when I started out in public speaking, I found it very, very painful, anxiety-making. I would get dry mouth, things like that. And then the more I did it, the less miserable I found it. I still find radio interviews totally miserable. (laughs) There's an entire American institution devoted to bridging the hot-cold empathy gap in situations far more physically taxing than a radio interview. It's the Army. Military leaders have long understood that there's a way to get soldiers to perform well in battle. Put them in hot states and teach them, through repetition, to stifle their natural impulses. My name is Anastasia Fish. I'm a second lieutenant in the United States Army, and I'm an armor officer. On a February morning in 2019, Anastasia had her roommate drive her to Camp Darby in Georgia. As they approached the camp, they passed a black and yellow sign that Anastasia had seen her friends pose in front of in their Instagram photos. The sign read, Not for the weak or faint-hearted. It's a warning and a boast for Army Ranger School. The school puts recruits through a grueling training program. Graduates often go on to elite units and important assignments. On the first full day of training, Anastasia says she had to take a test. You have two minutes to do 49 push-ups. You have two minutes to do 59 sit-ups. You have 40 minutes to run five miles. And then you have to do six pull-ups right afterwards. In the weeks that followed, Anastasia had to drop from a rope into cold water and swim, wearing her full uniform. She was kept awake for hours on end. She recalls a stretch of nine days where she only got ten hours of sleep total. She was constantly distracted by hunger. We looked at some videos online of Army Ranger training. It's hard to believe human beings could survive those challenges. All this suffering had a purpose, to put trainees like Anastasia into a hot state, even though her instructors called it something else. As far as ranger school goes, they they like to use the term stress inoculation. So they create a lot of stress, and then they teach you how to live in that and how to cope with it. The stressors were both physical and psychological. She was asked to oversee a dozen people in a simulated military mission. She had to organize a surprise attack. At first, I was very nervous about it. She had to force herself to calm down and think through what needed to be done. 
I kind of learned how to take pieces of the task and effectively execute the pieces, then I could look at basically a 5 meter target instead of a 50 meter target. And I could take my little 5 meter targets and I could very, very easily accomplish those tasks. She used simple tools, a notebook and pen, and made checklists. And then any time that I'd start to feel kind of panicked or anxious because I was like, things aren't happening fast enough because everyone's tired, or things aren't happening fast enough because people are distracted, I was able to look at my list and think about things that I could check off or things that were going to be checked off soon. And that really actually helped me relax because I knew that things were getting done and the more check marks I had on my list, the better I knew I was doing. Anastasia learned to control her behavior in different heart states, but it took weeks of round-the-clock training to get to that point. Few of us could handle what it takes to get our hungry, achy, exhausted selves to behave like our cold state selves. But not all challenges involve leading a team into battle. In civilian life, there can be less daunting ways to train yourself to respond to everyday challenges. Self-defense classes are designed to teach you how to respond if you're attacked. Fire drills are designed to teach you to keep your head during an emergency. Julie Woodzicker is developing a training program to help women respond to sexist comments and jokes. It's called Fighting Fire with Fire. So, for instance, a guy tells a sexist joke, and then the woman says, Wow, still single, huh, Mark? <laughs> Which is funny, but the guy knows that, like, oh, you know, she didn't like that. Every woman that you talk to can think of a time that they walked away from a situation where something sexist was said, and, you know, ten minutes later they think of the perfect comeback. Like, oh, I wish I had said this. And, of course, in the moment you don't think of it. So we're thinking if we can have a couple that are kind of in your back pocket, like... Can you repeat that and hear you over my eyes rolling? Or just things that are, you know, easy to say and would apply to a lot of situations. Maybe we can help women to confront in more subtle ways. Because it's hard. It's hard to tell people that they're being sexist. Judy thinks that in a better world, women wouldn't have this burden of devising comebacks. But for the moment, these one-liners give women tools. George Lewinstein says some hot-cold situations are too challenging for us to manage as individuals. I think the solution is good public policy. Specifically, he says, public policy should make it easier for people in a hot state to make the same decisions they would otherwise choose in a cold state. Condoms, he says, should be quickly and easily accessible. In other cases, George believes that policy should be designed to slow down our actions. If I got really angry at someone, I could just go down to Walmart and buy a gun today. That shouldn't be, you know, that shouldn't be possible. When you combine the instant availability of guns and empathy gaps, that's a very toxic mixture. He also sees implications for our criminal justice system, where judges and juries determine how to treat people who have acted in hot states. Take drug addiction, for example. People who have never experienced drug craving, they are not going to uh, have any understanding of how powerfully motivating it can be. I sometimes ask my students, suppose you were addicted to heroin, can you imagine ever abandoning your children or stealing from your parents? And you know, everyone says, of course, I would never do that. But if they were addicted to heroin, it's very likely that they would do that. So. In so many of these different situations, like in the criminal justice system, it's so easy for people to condemn the behavior of people who are experiencing states that they themselves are not experiencing when they make the judgment. We might need policy to constrain our decisions. But one thing we can do on our own is to be more compassionate when we're judging others and ourselves. Nina Fuller, the woman who can't let go of that one night in the massage parlor half a century ago, doesn't consider herself judgmental of others. But for decades, she's had trouble extending such compassion to herself. I was ashamed that I wasn't a strong enough person. I said, no, I can't go, I gotta do this. You know, I was ashamed of that. The hot-cold empathy gap makes other people feel more different from us than they actually are. When someone does something we can't imagine that we would do, 
it's easy to be judgmental, to conclude they are weak, or worse, that they are bad people. This gap also makes us feel like strangers to ourselves. So the next time we confidently announce that we would absolutely do this, or we would never do that, we would be wise to remember that the people we are now are very different than the people we might become. This episode was produced by Raina Cohen and edited by Tara Boyle and Jenny Schmidt. Our team includes Parth Shah, Laura Quarell, and Thomas Liu. The legs are curled up. But kind of see uh, from the six there's a tip of one leg and then at the nine there's the tip of the other leg and he's not particularly spread out so that's three and you look eight to nine eight is the end of his abdomen nine uh, Eight and seven eighths. So he's like seven eighth body and head. These kind of are cool. Oops, because they eat roaches. food. Face hugger from aliens. These guys are actually fairly common around here. Run into the pine needles real good. Three inch.